Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let the people of God say, Amen. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled. That's what Jesus says after he reads in the synagogue from the 61st chapter of Isaiah, right? And he creates a sense of urgency by saying, today this scripture has been fulfilled be because there are consequences of that, right? There are things that are going to be different, that are going to be changed because this scripture has now been fulfilled in your hearing. But look, there is the trouble. What, <laughs> what scripture is this that has been fulfilled, right? I mean, I, I have a little bit of trouble because we actually get a story but we get two parts of it, and today we get the second part. We read the first part last Sunday when we found Jesus uh, in the verses right ahead of these, when we find Jesus in the synagogue, in his hometown of Nazareth, where he has grown up, and he reads, he's given the scroll, he's the assisting minister basically, right, Kathy? And he's given the scroll, and he reads from Isaiah 61, and here is what he read. We, we find that out last week. He reads, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has sent me to proclaim good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of the sight of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. Those are really important words. In some sense, they are Jesus' mission statement, right? His, his purpose for the ministry that he's now beginning. See, in Luke, he's at the very beginning of his ministry, right? Um, we had the Christmas story, of course, and then we found Jesus being baptized by John in the Jordan, and the Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove. You remember that story? And then that same spirit, Luke said, drove him into the desert for 40 days, for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. And then immediately after that, he goes to the synagogue in Nazareth where he has grown up. So this is the beginning of his public ministry. In some sense, it's his maiden sermon, right? The first sermon, the first public kind of speaking engagement that he has. <laughs> and of course, he immediately gets himself into trouble. He wouldn't be Jesus if he didn't. He, he reads this Isaiah text that's kind of like his mission statement. And, and the thing that fascinates me, if you think about it, just back in Advent, we read about the Magnificat, the song that his mother, Mary, sings when she finds out that she is pregnant with Jesus. And, and doesn't she say similar things there? This is in the first chapter in Luke. Mary sings, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. Do you see the parallels here between what Jesus is reading and what Mary was singing? Back then, just a few weeks ago, we read that. This is, this is powerful stuff. These are words that will change the world and that will turn the world upside down. And, but that's not why Jesus gets in trouble. <laughs> it's not the words themselves. It's, it's how Jesus then interprets these words. He says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing, and, and, and if he would stop there, he'd be just fine, right? Luke says that everybody was amazed, and they just loved it, and they were so proud because he was a hometown boy that had made good, and he had come back, and he was just doing great. But, but Jesus doesn't leave well enough alone, of course, and then he starts interpreting that, and, and he talks about, he tells these two stories. He talks about how in the time of Elijah, the prophet, there was a famine, right? The heavens were shut up. It was a drought. It didn't rain for three and a half years. And he talks about how the prophet Elijah was then sent to a poor widow to, to give her some bread. And the widow lived in Serapath in Sidon, which means this widow was a Gentile. She was not part of the Jewish society. And the second story he tells is very similar. He talks about how in the time of the prophet Elijah, when there were many leopards in Israel, 
the only one who was cleansed from leprosy and who was healed was Naaman, the Syrian. <laughs> and as that name already says, again, someone who was not Jewish, someone who was not part of the in crowd, someone who would not have been allowed into the synagogue to hear Jesus say this. That's what enrages the people that are listening to Jesus to the point that they take him out of town and they want to throw him off a cliff. Now, there actually isn't a cliff in Nazareth. If you went there, it would be a hard, um, you'd have a hard time finding it, but Nazareth is built on a hill and maybe they were going to just push him kind of down the hill and, and make him fall down there. But they, didn't go, they don't go that far. The reason they are upset, I think, is that they are expecting something else, right? There's a little bit of rivalry here. Did you pick that up? Because they say, well, in, 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 in Capernaum, where Jesus now lives, in Capernaum you've done all these great things and we heard about these miracles and the signs and the wonderful stuff you've done. Now you're in your hometown. We want to see some miracles too. I mean, they have some unfulfilled expectations here. Because Jesus isn't doing anything miraculous. He's simply reading from the Bible. He can't be made to do miracles just because people want to see a sign, right? Here's a, here's a very helpful quote that Brian Stoffregen had. He's somebody I often read. He's a Lutheran pastor now retired in, out in California. He says, besides examples of God's graciousness extending beyond Israel, those are those, the two stories, right, with Elijah and Elijah, they are examples of God's graciousness extending beyond Israel. I or he, Brian, also thinks that these stories, along with Jesus' comments, indicate that we can tell God what God should do. God is not under our bidding. God will love and bless and help whomever God wants to love and bless and help. Regardless of religion, you might want to add, regardless of national origin, regardless of race or culture or language or any of those other dividing things that we as human beings put up, God will love and bless and help whomever God wants to love and bless and help. Well, the good news here is that that includes us. Despite our selfishness and jealousy, as we see that in the audience in Nazareth, despite of that, God will love us and bless us and help us, whether we are part of the in crowd or not. That's sometimes a little hard for Christians to understand, right? There are Christian congregations out there who will say that the good news is just for them. And, and that unless you believe exactly what they believe, you're kind of missing out on God's blessing. Well, what Jesus tells us today is that God's love extends way beyond all the barriers that we throw up. What, what his hearers in the synagogue in Nazareth, because of their selfishness and jealousy, what, what they miss is what a radical change that is, what a radical change Jesus brings today. There is that word again. That radical change begins today. Now for Luke, that word today is really, really important, and it always signifies radical change. Here's a couple examples, right, in the Christmas story in Luke. The angels say to the shepherds in the field, today in the town of David, a savior has been born for you. Jesus on the cross to the thief who is crucified next to him says, today you will be with me in paradise. When he encounters Zacchaeus in that story, Zacchaeus is up on a tree, right, kind of hiding away. Jesus makes him come down and says, come down immediately, I must stay in your house today. And then later he says to Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house. And then, of course, the lesson today, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. See how important that word is for Luke today? Luke uses this word 12 times in his gospel. The other three gospels have it a combined nine times, much less than that. Right? Today, in Luke, always signifies a radical change where the world is being turned upside down. And that creates the kind of urgency for us too, that today is the day 
that the love of God and the blessings of God are going to enable and empower us to make a difference in a broken world and to heal the broken hearted, to feed the hungry, to lift up the lowly. Here's a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. that I really like. He said, we are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with the fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. This is no time for apathy or complacency. This is a time for vigorous and positive action. I, I don't know about you. I mean, you know, Martin Luther King said these words in the 1960s, but I might, he might as well have said it today. I mean, we live in a time that is just full of upheavals, Right? We just had the first anniversary of the insurrection at the Capitol. We are at the brink of war in Ukraine and Russia. I mean, there's just so much going on in the world all the time. And so many things that are broken and so many people that are hurting. This is a, there's a fierce urgency to address those things and to build a more just and a more peaceful world. There is no time, Dr. King says, there is no time for apathy and for complacency, which is precisely what we sometimes fall into because we do feel so powerless, right? I mean, what am I going to do about Russia going to invade Ukraine? There's nothing I can do to keep that from happening. What am I going to do about the interaction at the, at the capital? What am I going to do about our society being more and more divided by the day? I mean, it just feels so overwhelming. What am I going to do about COVID-19 and, and the second type of Omicron that now they have discovered? I mean, will this ever end? What am I going to do as an individual person or even as a community of faith? Well, today, I think we get an answer to that. Today, we get an answer to, for that because... What, what impresses me is how Jesus deals with this conflict, right? What does it say? Luke says, he passed straight through the crowd and walked away. So sometimes it's okay to walk away from a problem, but that leads to that apathy and that complacency, right, that Martin Luther King talked about. So think about that. If you read this carefully, he passed straight through the crowd and walked away, in a sense, he does walk away and he avoids the conflict that's brewing there, but, but he doesn't walk away on the other side. He walks straight through the crowd. He is still engaged. He is still relating to them. He is still there with them. And maybe that's part of the answer. And we, we get that answer in the first lesson today where Paul talks to us about love and how important love is, and how in the end, if you really get, get down to it, there are three things that remain that are important. Faith, and hope, and love, and that the greatest of these is love. So our response to the broken world isn't apathy and complacency. It's love. Our response to the crises that we find ourselves in is love, loving our neighbor who lives across the street and our neighbor who lives across the world and remembering that we are all part of God's creation, that these artificial divisions that we have thrown up don't mean anything in God because, for God because God will love and bless the whole world. Jesus calls us to remember. One more quote from a colleague who is a pastor in Illinois. Jesus calls us to remember we are beloved siblings and siblings cannot be our enemy. Our enemy is sin, death, and the devil, and Jesus has defeated all of them. The world we live in is full of division, and yet we live with a diametrically opposed, sure and certain hope we still believe the scriptures are being fulfilled. And that, my brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ, is the good news for you this morning. And to that, let the people of God say, Amen. Amen.